power switch, VFO and memories, there are 20 memories, the CQ caller, the attenuator, and it also selects the IF filter bandwidth and the RIT. The big knob is the tuning knob and the small knob, the volume control. It's a BNC antenna socket on the top and a 2.1mm power socket takes 12 volts. With the tuning steps, you can either go up by 1kHz increments or 100Hz increments. Nothing finer, unless you use the RIT. There's also 100kHz steps for big band excursions, like going from one end of the band to the other, or for general shortwave listening. What are the pluses? An excellent display, 20 memories, and a selection of filters between 400Hz and 900Hz on CW. And also wider for SSB reception. Because that's another thing, it's got a general coverage receiver between 5MHz and 16MHz. So you can use it to listen to WWV, shortwave broadcast stations, SSB amateurs and more. There is an internal battery holder, but I didn't use it. It was handy having an inbuilt Kia, as well as an automatic CQ caller. But I should point out that you can't completely customise the automatic CQ caller. It always ends in PSEK. You can't get rid of the PSE. Also, you must press the button every time you want it to call. What are some of the deficiencies? The volume isn't quite enough to comfortably drive a speaker, particularly on 20 metres. This is really a headphones only set. There's an oddity in that you must plug in the key or Kia before turning on the power. And the automatic CQ function only works with a paddle plugged in, not with a straight key. With the antenna socket disconnected, you can hear some birdies from the LCD display or the frequency synthesizer when you're tuning across the band. However, in normal use with an antenna, you shouldn't notice them. I would have also liked an SWR indicator. As that isn't in the rig, I'll just have to use the field strength meter and hope for the best. The attenuator is very severe, maybe around 30 dB, which is too much. A couple of other things could have been done better. Notice the profile of the radio. See how far the knobs stick out. For a backpacker type radio, likely to cop a lot of abuse, that is bad design. Knobs should be concealed or recessed. Otherwise, there's a likelihood of them catching and their spindles bending. Similarly, the display. That could have been covered. Now luckily there's a screw right next to the display and you may just be able to make a small bit of perspex to cover it and give a bit of protection. As for the overall finish, not perfect, it's satisfactory, not ideal and maybe the corners could have been a bit blunter, though I wouldn't say that they are particularly sharp. If the radio's volume isn't all that generous, then my favourite are small in-ear earphones. A hint for going portable. Make sure that the bag that encloses the radio has a zipper that goes three quarters the way around. The reason? If it rains, you can easily close it up and protect the radio. You're going to ask what I used as a battery. The packs cost about $2 from a ham fest and were originally from medical equipment. They were 24 volts, so I split them into two, 12 volts per pack. I wrapped it with gaffer tape and put a socket on it so I can plug in lead-ins to various QRP transceivers. As for the amp hour, I don't know, I think it's around 4 amp hour, but whatever it is, I get hours and hours of use with a QRP transceiver, particularly something like the Tentec that draws very little on receive. on the tech
Logitech R4020. I highly recommend it. It's a great rig and as you've seen from the log, it's producing great results.